So in the lecture last week, we talked about the first part of this topic, which is uh, managing um, foreign exchange rate risk exposure. And for last week, we focused a lot on transaction exposure, right? So for today, we are talking about other types of exposure. In particular, we're talking about economic exposure, okay? So when we say economic exposure, we are taking a big picture um, look at the firm's um, that asset or liability value and how it's sensitive to exchange rate movements, okay? So in this case, um, we are looking at the competitiveness of the company as a whole, okay? So if we want to define economic exposure, it will be the extent to which the value of the firm would be affected by unanticipated changes in the exchange rates, okay? So um, with economic exposure as opposed to transaction exposure, you don't have to be um, having an international trade to be affected by exchange rate changes, okay? So with transaction exposure, you would only be exposed to exchange rate risk if you have a foreign trade with a foreign partner. But in economic exposure, you don't have to be having an international trade to be affected by exchange rate risk, okay? So sometimes even purely domestic firms could be affected by exchange rate movements, okay? So for example, if I have a domestic company, say if I open a coffee shop and I sell coffee, okay? It's completely local, I'm just selling to the people in my community. Now, sometimes even when I just have a domestic business selling to domestic customers, my business would still be affected by the exchange rate movements, okay? Why is that the case? So for example, my customers might have, um, might either buy coffee from my shop or they could go to the supermarket to buy imported coffee, right, and make it themselves. So in that case, I am competed um, by imported goods, okay? Um, as another example, so with my business, even though I sell to domestic customers, but sometimes I have to buy um, imported um, supplies, right? So for example, I can source my coffee cups from China or from Southeast Asia, okay? So in this case, even though my company is a purely domestic company, but my competitive position could be affected by the currency movements, okay? So as another example, let's consider a very purely domestic company. So in this case, we've got a US bicycle manufacturer who sources, produces and sells only in the US, okay? So in this case, even my supply chain is within the domestic country. So even though my, uh, both my customers and my supply chain are in the domestic country, but my competitors might not, okay? So in this case, as a bicycle man manufacturer, I'm competing with manufacturers around the world, okay? So if the USD, for example, appreciates against the other trade partners' currencies, what will happen to the product market? So if the USD, for some reason, appreciates, that means it's easier for people from outside to import, to export into the US, okay? Because their goods and services become cheaper. So in this case, even though I don't have anything, I don't do anything else, any different, my customers are the same, my um, supply chain is the same, but my competition would change, okay? Because of a change in the exchange rate. Okay. So in terms of economic exposure, um, if we rank different industries by how much, uh, by how sensitive their stock prices are to foreign exchange rate movements, we can compute something like the beta, okay, for foreign exchange. So the idea here is um, if we want to compute the um, extent to which a company's value is sensitive to foreign exchange movements, we can calculate the sensitivity 
of that um, of the company stock returns to foreign exchange rate movements. Okay, so this is similar to computing the market beta in your capital asset pricing model. Okay, so here a higher beta means that I am more sensitive to exchange rate movements. Okay, so for example, if I compare this industry, so textile and this industry, I can say that this industry is very sensitive to exchange rate movements because I've got a beta of 1.8, whereas this industry's beta is only 0.43, okay? So the food industry is not as affected by exchange rate movements um, compared to the textiles industry, okay? So one point to note here is that with transaction exposure, it's easier to measure. Say, for example, if I have a transaction of 10 million pounds, um, the size of my transaction is how much I am exposed to foreign exchange rate risk, okay? With economic exposure, it's a bit harder to measure. And most of the time, we will measure economic exposure using the sensitivity of the asset value to exchange rate movements, okay? which um, leads me to the next slide. So as we mentioned before, with economic exposure, we will measure it using the sensitivity of the um, value of the asset in the home currency um, and the changes in exchange rates, okay? So we could break it down into two um, different groups. So we could be measuring the sensitivity of our asset values or liability values to changes in exchange rates. Or alternatively, we could also measure the changes in our firm's cash flows to changes in exchange rates, okay? So to illustrate the point, now um, what I'm interested in here is I'm interested in how these two are related, okay? So how would my firm value um, in the domestic currency, how is it sensitive to exchange rate movements, okay? So there are two channels through which exchange rates might affect the firm value. The first one is through an asset exposure. So the value of my assets and liability could change when exchange rate moves, okay? Alternatively, um, exchange rate could also affect my firm value through a change in the operating exposure, okay? So with the example that I gave you before, so when the exchange rate change, the, um, the number of people that buy coffee for my shop might change and that might hurt or it might increase my cash flows, okay? So let's look at the first scenario where we measure the sensitivity of um, our asset value to exchange rates using, uh, by focusing on the asset side, okay? So here I'm looking at the asset and liabilities of the firm and how they are sensitive to exchange rate movement, okay? So in this case, we measure economic exposure using the sensitivity of my asset value to the exchange rates, okay? So, we could measure the sensitivity using this equation over here, where on the left-hand side, I've got my asset value in the domestic currency. So this is my asset value in my domestic currency, okay? So I want to know how the asset value might change when the exchange rate changes, okay? So on the right-hand side, I've got the exchange rate, say in this case, it's the US versus the um, PAL, okay? So if I run this regression, if you remember from statistics 101, so this coefficient here, this beta here, tells you how much um, your asset value would change when um, the exchange rate changes, okay? So by definition, it measures how sensitive your asset value is 
to exchange rate movement. Okay. Alpha is a constant, so it doesn't change with um, the exchange rate. And error is a measurement um, error. Okay, so epsilon is a measurement error. So in this uh, in this regression, what we are interested in is we are interested in the beta here, which tells us how sensitive our asset value is to exchange rates. Okay. So if we want to define beta um, properly, beta will be given by the covariance between the asset value in the domestic country. So P here is your asset value in the domestic country um, and the exchange rate divided by the variance of the exchange rates. Okay. So that means there are two sources of economic exposure. The first one is the variance of the exchange rates. And the second one is the covariance between the domestic um, value of the asset and the exchange rates. Okay. So we can say that beta is the standardized measure of sensitivity. Okay. So if you recall from your investment portfolio, portfolio investment subject, this is very similar to how we measure the market beta, right, in the capital asset pricing model, because the idea here is exactly the same, okay? You're measuring the co-movements between your asset value, P, and your um, exchange rate, S, okay? So let's look at how it is applied in an example. So suppose in this case, we have a US company that has an asset in France um, and the local currency price is random, okay? For simplicity, let's look at three different states of the world and let's look at how, let's look at how the asset value in the USD is affected when the exchange rate changes, okay? So I'm gonna um, denote the value of this um, of this asset in the euro as P star. The exchange rate is S, and the value of the asset in the USD, which is my home currency, is P. Okay. So to summarize the um, example, let's look at case one. So in each of these cases, I'm assuming that there will be three different possibilities in the future and they have equal probabilities, okay? So I've got three different states and each of the states have the same probability. Now, suppose that we're looking at case one here. P star is the value of the asset in France, okay? Denominated in the uh, foreign currency, which is the euro. So in each of these states, we, uh, we can observe the values of P star. Okay, so as you can see, the value of our asset in the foreign currency changes with the states of the world, okay? In the second column, I've got the spot exchange rate. So these are the values of the exchange rate between the USD and the Euro in each of the states. Um, my last column is what I'm interested in. So this is the value of the asset in the home currency, okay? So this is the USD value of my asset, okay? And it's given by the value of the foreign currency times the exchange rates, okay? Does that make sense? Here I'm just doing a currency conversion. So what we are interested in as a US company is we want to know how our USD asset value might change um, given different states of the world, okay? So when the exchange rate changes, how will my USD value change, okay? Now let's look at the other two cases. So in case two, 
this is we are assuming that we are in a different world and in this world we still have three different possibilities and in each of these possibilities these are what we observe okay so once again the weight for the uh, different states are the same in terms of the foreign currency asset value these are the different values of the foreign currency okay of the asset in the foreign currency we still have the same sort of exchange rates here exchange rate movement here and these are the corresponding values for our usd um, value okay so if i take this and i times this i will get the usd value so what do you say about the second case suppose this is the world i live in as a us company i will be very happy about it right so in this case it looks like doesn't matter what happens to the exchange rates my us value the us value of my asset is going to be the same okay so in this case as a us investor or as a us company i do not have to worry about exchange rate movement at all okay so if you notice what happens here with the um, euro values and the exchange rates you can see that they have a perfect negative um, relation okay so when uh, when the exchange rate is very low your asset value in the euro is high and vice versa okay and as a result the net outcome is that your us value does not change okay in the last case um, suppose we are in another world again for some reason we can teleport to this world and in this case um, i've got three different states again so i observed that in this world um, doesn't matter what happens to the exchange rates my uh, foreign currency asset value so the value of this asset in the euro stays the same okay so you can think of this as like uh, maybe real estate so real estate values are not changed too much with currency movements okay so regardless of how my exchange rate moves, my asset value in the euro does not change, okay? Which means that whatever changes in the exchange rates will be reflected 100% to my um, USD value, okay? So as you can see here, when exchange rate changes, it will go directly to my um, um, USD value at the one-to-one -one ratio okay so if we stay here in case three if we are in we're living in this world um, the economic exposure of my asset will be exactly the same as the transaction exposure of this asset okay so in any case my uh, asset value in the euro would be a hundred a thousand dollars a thousand euro and so this will simply just be a question of transaction exposure okay so which scenarios are more realistic okay so the answer here is it depends on which industry you are um, you are in or which type of asset you're talking about okay so for some industries, for example, in real estate, um, you will see that the value of real estate does not change too much when the currency moves, when the exchange rate moves. So it's more likely that in real estate, you'll be dealing with something like this in the short run, okay? Case two is not very likely to happen in real life because it's very, uh, it's very rare that you will see you have no um, exchange rate exposure at all okay although in some industries you might so the most common one that we would observe is something like case one okay where our asset value say our, our portfolio um, value for example 
my change when the exchange rates change, okay? And in that case, we will have a different change in our domestic currency value, okay? So, um, so we reiterate um, in case one, this is when we have the local currency price of the asset and the exchange rate uh, moving in the same direction. So when the value of the asset is low, your currency value is low and um, so on and so forth, right? So in this case, if there is a positive correlation between your um, I'm going to say this is um, foreign, okay? Just to distinguish between our domestic and the foreign currency. So if your foreign currency asset value and the exchange rate are positive, positively correlated, then it will give rise to substantial exchange rate risk because as one moves, um, it will be amplified by a move in the other um, value. Okay. So in case two, this is what we have talked about before. In case two, there is no exchange rate risk at all. In case three, this is when your um, foreign asset value does not change. So it's very similar to a transaction exposure. Okay. So let's look at how we can hedge um, case one, okay? So assume that we have an asset that looks like this. The question here is, how do we hedge the um, domestic currency value of our asset, okay? Now, in this case, it's not very simple as in the transaction exposure because the transaction value itself changes, okay? So in this case, we have to do we have to do something similar to our um, regression example before, where we calculate the B coefficient, okay? So just a little bit of a uh, review or recap from Statistics 101. So in this case, if we want to hedge the currency exposure for a case like this, like case one, we need to compute the B coefficient in our previous um, formula, okay? where B is equal to the covariance between P and S divided by the variance of S, okay? So just as I note here, to compute B, we have two different approaches. We could either run a regression and find the B coefficient from the regression, or we could use this formula, okay? So for the purpose of this subject, we will stick to the formula approach, which is to compute B using the covariance divided by the variance, okay? So to compute the covariance and the variance, you need to know three different formulas. So firstly, you need to know how to compute the uh, probability weighted average, okay? So in this case, this is just a calculation of the mean um, in the case where you have different probabilities for the future, okay? So for example, if I have a world where there are two different scenarios, so there could be a 75% chance that my asset value is two, and then there is a 25% chance that my asset value is one, okay? So if I want to compute the probability weighted average of this asset value, it's going to be probability one times value one plus probability two times value two, okay? And this will give you the uh, probability weighted average, okay? Now, the second formula you need to know is you need to know how to calculate a variance. So here is the formula. So this is just the probability weighted um, sum of square, okay? So here you've got your 
um, state one, probability one, value of x1 minus the mean, which is what we computed from before, plus state two, probability two, um, so on and so forth, okay? The third formula you need to know is you need to know the covariance, okay? So when we say covariance, we are talking about a co-movement between two different variables, um, x and y in this case, or in your B coefficient formula, it will be the covariance between your domestic currency value, P, and your spot exchange rates, okay? And this is divided by the variance of S. Okay, so um, as your two assets, um, as the two variables um, are more interrelated or more co um, correlated, you would expect your covariance to increase, okay, and vice versa. So in the next slide, we are going to use these formulas to um, compute the sensitivity of our asset value to the exchange rate for case one, okay? So here I'm looking at case one, and if we remember from um, our previous question, if we still have the question with us. So to compute the mean, this is what I'm doing. So I'm just going to take, um, so here, these are the probabilities, right? So we've got three different states of the world. And for each state, they have an equal probability, which is a third for each of them. So if we want to compute the, um, the average asset value, it will be just a simple average, um, just, just the sum of the three different asset values divided by three, okay, which is the probability. To compute the average spot exchange rates, we are going to apply the same formula. So I'm taking the sum of all the exchange rates in three different scenarios, and I'm going to divide that by three, okay. So to compute the variance, it does look a little bit messy, right? So with the variance formula, I'm just going back to the previous slide. So it will be probability one times x1 minus x bar squared, um, so on and so forth. So in this case, we've got three different states of the world. And so we have three different um, square terms, okay? So here, because the weight, the probability is the same for all of the three scenarios. I'm going to take them out, okay? So for the variance of S, this is the answer that I've got. For the covariance, I'm going to compute the covariance following the formula here, okay? So here I've got, oopsie. So here I've got P, I, and S, and the weights for each of the probabilities, for each of the states is the same, so one over three. So here I've got the difference between P1 and P bar from here. This is S1 and S bar. This is P2 minus P bar, S2 minus S bar, so on and so forth, okay? So this will give me 34 over three. And finally, for my beta or B um, coefficient, I will take the covariance, I'll divide it by the variance, okay? And that will give me this number here, which is 1,700. So once I computed the um, beta coefficient, what am I going to do with that? Okay. So what am I going to do with that, guys? 
Now, in this case, if you want to hedge your economic exposure, you would want to take a position in the forward contract with a size equal to the B coefficient, okay? So here I'm going to sell 1,700 euro forward to hedge my position here, okay? So this size is given by my beta coefficient I calculated before. My next question is, how do I know if I want to sell or I want to buy, okay? So in this case, um, this is my asset, okay? So this is something I have. Um, so as an asset, eventually when I sell the asset, I'm going to be selling the euros to exchange for the USD, okay? So here in the future, if I want to convert this asset back into the USD, I'm going to be selling the euros for the USD, okay? So this is similar to your account receivable. So as a result, if I want to hedge this transaction, I will be selling uh, the foreign currency, okay? So in the next calculation, I'm going to illustrate why when we do so, we will eliminate exchange rate risk exposure to our asset value, okay? So suppose that the forward rate in this case is 1.5, okay? So 1.5 is my forward rate. And to hedge this economic exposure, I'm going to be selling 1,700 euros forward at the forward rate of 1.5, okay? So let me put up my notes and show you how by doing so I eliminate, um, I minimize exchange rate risk exposure. Okay. I'm going to bring it here. All right. So this is my note. So in this case, we want to sell 1,700 euro forward at the forward rate of 1.5. So with my forward contract, this is my payoff function, right? So I've got a short forward and therefore my payoff function is F minus S times the um, notional amount of 1,700. So I'm going through each of these scenarios here. So in the first scenario, um, when ST is 1.4, so here I've got ST equals to 1.4. When ST is 1.4, if I exchange, um, and this is the value of the asset in the euro, okay? So in this scenario, when ST is 1.4, when I exchange the euro back into the USD, this is how much I will get in the USD, right? So in this case, when the exchange rate is 1.4, my asset value in the USD would be 1,372, okay? So suppose I don't hedge this transaction, um, my asset value would be 1,372, okay? Now, suppose I hash this um, exposure using a forward contract at the start. So by the end of the year, I'm going to settle my forward contract. And for that contract, I get a payoff of um, 1,700 times 1 1.5, which is my forward rate, minus the spot exchange rate of 1.4, okay? So in this case, with my forward contract, I've got another 170 USD, okay? So as a result, my overall position, um, my overall hedge position would be 1,542, okay? So this is closer to 1,500, okay? In the second scenario, when the spot exchange rate is 1.5, so if I go back to my slide, so we are here, 
when the exchange rate is 1.5, my asset value in the euro would be 1,000. And in this case, when I convert it back into the USD, I will get 1,100, okay? So if I don't hedge, that's all I got, okay? If I hedge, so if I hedge by selling the, the selling 1,700 euro forward, then in this case, my forward net settlement will be zero because this is exactly the same as the forward rate, okay? So my total position would therefore be 1,500. In the third scenario, this is when my um, asset value in the euro is 1,070. My exchange rate is 1.6. So if I convert this back into the USD, I got 1,700 something. Okay, so if I choose to hedge this position, when the future spot rate is 1.6, my forward contract would make a loss, which is a, um, 170 USD, right? So this is 1,700 times 1.5 minus 1.6, okay? So my total hedge position in this case is therefore, um, 1,712, which is the unhedged position, minus the forward payoff, okay? So in this case, I've got 1,542, okay? Go back to the slide. So I have shown you how we can compute the value of the hedge position in the previous note. So in terms of foreign exchange rate risk management, if we compare the variance of the outcomes in the unhedged position and the variance of the outcomes with the hedge position, you can see that these values are very close together, okay? So it doesn't matter how the exchange rate moves, you are going to get around 1,500 USD, okay, in your asset value. In contrast with an unhedged position, it could change quite dramatically, right? So whenever your exchange rate changes, your asset value will change accordingly, okay? So in terms of risk management, we have managed to reduce the uh, volatility of our asset value here, okay? With a short forward. So this slide shows you how to um, how you can use the beta coefficient to hedge an economic exposure, okay? And it illustrates to you how your asset value might be protected um, when you do so, okay? All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is operating exposure. So in this case, um, we are focusing on the competitive position of the firm, okay, which is not very easily measurable. So with this operating exposure, it's even harder to measure relative to the economic exposure that we talked about before, okay. So here, one way to measure it is to measure the sensitivity of your cash flows to exchange rate movements, okay? So for this um, type of exposure, we do not have to worry about any calculation. We will just discuss the concepts, okay? So let's look at operating exposure. Let's look at an, an, an example of operating exposure, okay? So here I've got a um, situation where we are looking at the shipping market from Asia after the Asian currency crisis, okay? So after the crisis, a lot of companies went bankrupt. And so it was very hard to find a shipping company from Asia, okay? So there was an enormous shortage of shipping from Asia because of the crisis, okay? So in this case, um, how did this happen? How did, how did this affect the companies in two different um, industries, okay? 
So firstly, for the shipping companies, so for those that can survive, um, they will find that this is a very good opportunity for them because now with a lot of shipping companies going out of uh, business in Asia, this is a chance for them to jump in, okay? On the other hand, if we look at a different industry, which is the retail industry, so for this industry, if they have to source their business from, if they have to source their supplies from Asia, um, they will find that it's very hard to do so now, right? Because the shipping companies are not that easy to find anymore, okay? So for this industry, the cost of production will increase, okay? So for the retail industry, what would happen here, right? So with retailers, um, this might impact their cash flows in two different ways. In terms of the competitive effect, because of the difficulties in shipping, it will make it harder for these companies to ship goods and, uh, and products, okay? So what it does is that, say if you have a retailer in the US, now it is now very hard for Asian companies to ship goods and products into the US and therefore the local US retailers will find this um, beneficial for them, right? So there will be a reduction in competitiveness from Asian countries, okay, for US retailers. At the same time, because of the low um, value of the Asian currencies, it means that goods and services coming out of Asia becomes more attractive to buyers in the US, okay? So in this case, um, in this respect, this will increase the competitiveness of Asian goods and services, okay? So this example shows you that when you have a change in the currency um, exchange rates, there might be op um, opposite effects to your competitiveness, okay? So the overall effect to a retailer in the US is therefore not very clear in this case, okay? Because we have two competing effects going on at the same time. All right, so how is the operating exposure of different companies determined? So with operating exposure, we are talking about cash flows, right? So the firm's operating exposure is determined by two things. The first thing is the market structure of inputs and products um, or how competitive um, the market is, okay? The second factor is the firm's ability to adjust its um, product itself, okay? So if we can differentiate our products to our competitors from overseas, then it might give us a better chance to survive any change in exchange rates, okay? So as an example, now suppose we have a US company and our main market is Mexico, okay? So recently we have observed that the USD has um, appreciated against the Mexican peso. So the USD has become more expensive relative to the Mexican peso, okay? So the question here is what would happen to our competitiveness if in the first scenario, our main competitors are from the local market in Mexico, okay? Alternatively, if we operate in an industry where our main competitors come from the US, then what would happen in that case, okay? So here, um, when the USD appreciates, what happens to the US goods and services? So when the USD appreciates, the prices of goods and services produced in the US would increase, okay? So goods and services um, imported from the US would increase in price relative to the Mexican goods, okay? So in the first scenario, when our main competitors are local producers, 
what happens here is that um, our products becomes more expensive, whereas our competitors' products stay the same. Okay, stay the same. So in this case, uh, it looks like our competitiveness has decreased, right? Because our competitors now become more attractive to consumers. In the second case, this is when our main competitors are US companies. So for example, you can think of the car industry. So most of the cars are produced by the US, um, Japan, Korea, and the Europe, okay? So Mexico, Mexico is not a big car um, producer. So in this case, if our main competitors are mostly from the US, what happens here is our products prices would increase and at the same time our competitor prices would also increase okay so the net effect here is that the price in the market would increase but our competitiveness does not change okay so this example illustrates to you how the um, structure of the product market might affect our competitiveness differently okay Okay, so what are the different ways that we can manage our operating exposure? So one way is we can choose a lower cost production site. So this is what multinational companies do a lot, right? So you can choose a place where the currency is soft, meaning that the currency value is quite low um, to have your production sites there. Okay, so this will minimize um, the chance that the currency the foreign currency will appreciate in the future. Um, you could also follow a flexible sourcing policy. So what do we mean by that? That means you might have different productions in different countries. And when it needs to be, you can ship your production from one country to the other country. Okay. You could also diversify your markets. So you could have your product sold in some other some countries um, in the world so that when one country's currency becomes too strong um, you've got another country to diversify away okay product differentiation so this is what we talked about before so to reduce the competitiveness from um, other competitors you can make your products unique meaning that the consumers have to buy from you rather than from everyone else okay Financial hedging. So in this case, uh, we could use financial derivatives to hedge our position, similar to what we went through before with the transaction exposure and economic exposure, okay? So with real life examples, um, we have seen companies do this in the past, right? So for example, um, Toyota has um, sold its car to the US, okay? So the US is the main market for Toyota. So what they did was to hedge the exchange rate risk exposure on their income. They have also built um, some manufacturers in North America as well, okay? Um, where, they, where they sell the market, where they sell the products, okay? So um, similarly with Michelin, um, they have 40% of their sales in North America or the US or Canada. And as a result, um, they price their raw materials in the USD as well, okay? So they match the currency on their income with their expenses, okay? Similarly with BMW, they create natural hedges by producing cars in where um, their market is, which is America and Britain. Okay, so to summarize the lecture of today um, for this topic, we uh, in this topic, we have talked about three different types of foreign exchange exposures. 
So transaction exposure, this is when we talk about one particular transaction, okay? Economic exposure. So in this topic, we focus on the exposure of our asset and liability values, okay? With operating exposure, this is when we discuss how our cash flows or our competitiveness might change when the exchange rate changes, okay? So in terms of measuring foreign exchange rate exposure, the idea here, the rule of thumb here, is we want to measure the sensitivity of our position or our cash flows to the foreign exchange rate movements, okay? So this is the sensitivity of our um, asset in question to changes in exchange rates. So finally, throughout this topic, we talk about how we can manage this kind of risk. And uh, we differentiated the risk management tools into two. One is financial hedge. So in this case, you would use a financial derivatives to hedge your position. Um, companies could also follow something that we call nat um, natural hedge. So in this case, you would try to, for example, match your cash flows on the income with the cash flows on the expense, okay? So if you sell most of your products in America, you probably want to invoice your expenses in the USD as well, okay? So that is called natural hedge. So that is it for today's lecture. Um, and we, ho we have also concluded the topic. Now we have about 30 minutes left and I'm happy to stay back to go through any questions that you guys have for the midterm. Okay, or if you wanted to um, finish early, we can also do that, okay? So um, yeah, so I'll be staying back for a little while. If you have any questions, feel free to stay. Or if you don't have any questions, you can leave as well, okay? In which case, I will see you next week.